Can I ask you to turn your mobile phones to silent or off, please? Because this morning, you are the first audience at the first event of this year's Ideas Festival, and it's going to be vodcast live on the uh, Ideas Festival website. So uh, you're being beamed live out to the world as we speak. So welcome to the 2011 Ideas Festival. My name's Rod Welford, erstwhile former, some would say failed, arts minister. Uh, returning to one of my bases here at the uh, State Library to participate in this year's Ideas Festival. And what a wonderful lineup of events we've got uh, at this year's festival indeed. Um, and none much better than what we've got to kick off today. Uh, and I think it's a reflection of the interest in our anxiety about this topic, status anxiety, I think there was uh, one philosopher called it, um, about the size of homes. A little anecdote before I introduce our special guest, Malcolm Holtz. In 1987, I built a solar home in the suburbs, on the northern suburbs of Brisbane. It was surrounded by Mac mansions. It was one of the last blocks to be built on. Comparatively speaking, my modest home, single level, or multiple levels, but uh, not double storey, nestled into the sloping hillside. When I showed it to the builder, who I was going to ask to build it, he said, if you build that, they'll drive you out of the suburb. Didn't face the street, actually faced north. <laughs> Strange as that may seem. Uh, and of course, it wasn't imposing uh, on everyone around in the landscape like most of the other houses. I did ultimately build it, uh, and it was a pleasure to live in, but it may not have qualified for what we're going to hear about this morning, an international trend to micro-housing. What is it that drives this obsession with size? Why do we think that big is better when it comes to housing? And what creates this momentum? Well, this momentum is being challenged by people like Malcolm Holtz, who, in collaboration with celebrated Sunshine Coast architects Gabriel and Elizabeth Poole, have taken up the international trend of micro-housing and created the concept of hut, hut wheels. What are hut wheels we'll look forward to hearing? And what is this international trend? I must say, uh, my antenna hasn't been long enough to pick it up, but I'm very keen to find out because I want my next home to be more modest than the one I've got. How can we reimagine our living spaces, probably the most important aspect of amenity and mental health in our lives in a way that finds less is more. Malcolm brings uh, to the Australian market a possible solution for more affordable and more sustainable living. In a landscape where space is at a premium and resources are in demand, could this micro-mansion trend spark a whole new great Australian dream? Malcolm's been involved for 25 years as a designer, working with property development companies to turn creative ideas into commercial innovations. He's been instrumental, pardon the pun, uh, instrumental in uh, influencing the design of thousands of small lot homes in southeast Queensland, from Green Street to Kiwana Island and beyond. So please, for our inaugural, inaugural session at the 2011 Ideas Festival, Will you please welcome, very warmly, Malcolm Holtz. Thank you very much. I'd just like to start with a song, a bit, obviously, about a big country. Silhouette horizons, angels dust, molasses lights, an ancient crust, Williams Plains, relentless rust, soul winds, wanderlust, 
wanderlust in a big country. She oaks sigh, June Lee, forest rain. Crash randomly, crystal waves, deep blue sea, deep blue sea, ran a big country. Urban tide rocks and rolls, tiny towns, country calls, blue sunsets, suburban soul, a sacred space of one's own, a home of one's own in a big country. Big country. It's a great way to warm up, actually. We are indeed privileged to live in this great big country. Thank you. This uh, talk today is a story about two of the biggest material things that define our lives in this big country. Two things which are arguably our biggest financial investments. The things we seem to spend the most incredible amounts of time in. It is a story which challenges the great Australian dream as it spreads across this land, on the edge, on the outback, in the centres of cities, country towns and the suburbs. It is a story, and I make no apologies for this, that is about reinventing the wheels in an Australian context. It is a story, if you are musically minded, that has three or four movements tied together with a common theme. This is a story about moving home. This intricate and deep relationship we have with our house, our dwelling place and the things we use to move around, notably the car. Moving around is the first movement in this story where some observations are made about the immense amount of time, energy and space we give and the sometimes ridiculous lengths we go to move around. The second movement, as Rod introduced, is the micro-movement, the growing global, almost counter-cultural movement to things smaller and smaller as it is being played out in some of the more radical corners of the housing and the motor vehicle industries. The blend of housing and motor vehicles is actually the inspiration for Hut Wheels. Hut Wheels is the fourth movement, and I'll get to it. The third movement comprises some reflections, some personal reflections on my own history of living in micro to small spaces, as this story is not only about the micro, sometimes you have to go to an extreme to, to get a point across, it's also about the small and how poignant and poetic small can be. 
I will show you how I've spent most of my time in small spaces, whether a car, a room or a house. Experiences which are continuing and confirming the potential for micro to small spaces to become the real tour de force in dwellings in the future, that is, moving home. But first, how can you challenge the great Australian dream? It's a challenge. This is the challenge. Now, I want to make it very clear that I'm, I'm not here to bag anyone or diss anyone that, of the people that I'm showing here today. In fact, if I had $1.2 million, I'm not sure I'd spend it on this, but this is what's going on in this country. And good luck to people who can afford the $1.2 million house at, funnily enough, Castle Hill for a small family. So what this article in the, in the Great Australian Newspaper had alongside it was some interesting statistics that in Australia, we're actually building the biggest new, new houses are now the biggest in the world. And we've outstripped the United States of America in the last couple of years. So the top there, Australia is 214.6 square metres per new dwelling. And you can see on the chart on the right how that's been growing. On average, that means per person for new dwellings in Australia, it's 83 square metres, outstripping the US at 78 square metres. UK down at 32 square metres. So what's going on? What's going on? Here we have, this is, this is a house at Castle Hill, it's on the market at the moment. Have a look at it. Three car garage and it's no wonder you have need, a, need three cars because most of the time these buildings are actually in cul-de-sacs so where there's you know, no, no public transport. Um, now, I'll put my hand up and say I've developed a lot of cul-de-sacs in, in my time and, you know, they were, the, they were meant to be the wonderful quiet spaces where kids could go out and play in it and so on. But you do need a car to get around. The bus doesn't go down there. And, you know, <laughs> um, we're talking about something that is really sacred here. This is our, this is our home. And, you know, we, we go to great lengths. That's Kath and Kim's house at Fountain Lakes. Have a look at what dominates, the car. And we all, we've all probably all seen the, the, um, the news, well, the, the, the film of, of that, what goes on in there. Interesting enough, it's actually in a cul-de-sac. So unless you're waterborne and have public transport, for example, through that, once again, you've got to be in your car. So these things define us. And, uh, you know, I cried when I saw this movie, at the end of this movie, it was just amazing. So you're a bit close to transport, <laughs> but um, still, um, you know, it's every man's castle, so to speak, you know, presumably every woman's castle. It's something that we crave. But are we dreaming? Are we really dreaming? When you look at some of these other statistics, like a median house price in Brisbane, 2010, got past uh, 500000 half a million dollars. And when you compare that with what the average household income is in Brisbane, around 42000 that's a low to moderate income, as the Queensland government suggests. So, pe so people such as a nurse on 40000 a year, construction worker and a teacher maybe on $76,000 a year. What does that buy you? If you're lucky, you might be able to buy a new 160 square metre house on a 300 square metre lot for $372,000. This little chart on, up there says that a gross household income of 80000 might buy you something in around the $400,000 mark. If you're really lucky if, and you're at the $40,000 mark, you might be able to buy a new 80 square metre house on a 150 square metre lot for $210,000. But where do you find that? Where do you find that? Add to the, this phenomenon, these phenomena, the fact that by 2026, the state government's saying to us that 60% of all households will only comprise one or two people. So, and that's an even split, 30% singles. And you wonder what, what's going on. Well, it might account for why there's so much space per new dwelling if the, if the, the household size re is reducing. But still, you would ask, why do you need 83 square metres every single person? So it is about status, Rob, I think. Let's do it. The other interesting phenomenon that's going on 
And, you know, we spend about $250 billion a year on housing. But this is a funny, funny thing. You know, cash on wheels, half a million dollars um, in the Adelaide now in 2008. In 2007, two million Australians went on mobile holidays. And during the GFC in 2009, I find this amazing, even though it's a small proportion of what we might spend on housing in Australia, we spent $5 billion in the boat, bike and caravan category. So what, what's going on? It's just, I, I find it fascinating. I'm intrigued by all of this, really. And that's um, really where this, it goes from here. So, this movement, moving around. The amount of time and space and energy we've put into this. Thankfully, we don't have this problem in the Middle East. We're not quite there yet in terms of Shanghai. You know, the public transport system may be fantastic in Tokyo, but and maybe this would be a good thing to, to see this happening in, in Australia. And I'm sure, <laughs> and I'm sure we've all been in the uh, in the bus, you know, with the smelly armpits and wandering around. So have a look at this. This is the impact that the motor vehicles had in the US. You know, we've got eight lanes, of, I think it is, going both ways, and then these incredible flyovers and whatnot. Incredible amounts of space given over to this moving around. Um, I'm not sure where these are, but um, it's, I just find it incredible how much space and time. And then we get up in the air. You probably have seen that movie with... Uh, George Clooney, you know, 10 million miles in the air and he gets his name on a plane. Well, fantastic. I mean, why do we do it? Well, probably because we can. And then you see these sorts of things emerging. You fly in and you fly out, literally. You're not talking about mining companies here. You're talking about residents. And then even when we've finished moving, we do some things like this. And why is it, though? Why is it that when we're on holidays or going to a festival or something that we're very happy to be in these tiny, tiny spaces and right next door to each other. We seem to be happy campers. You know? In Australia, this, this, is, this is culture. This is the, the beach. You know, we get, where do we go? The caravan at the beach. How many people in the room have, have ever been in a caravan at the beach for summer holidays? You don't know what you're missing. <laughs> early, early. It was happening, you know, in the 1900s. And don't, don't let us... Don't, think that we're, not, we're uh, free from it in Brisbane, that's Bowen Hills, and I understand the locals call it the Vomitron, and if you get on it, look out. <laughs> this is Sydney, freeway in Sydney. So it's a big yellow taxi, it's the parking lot. Now the point I'm making here is that we have an incredible amount of space, and what happens when congestion really hits in, and all of a sudden we are going to be more and more forced onto public transport? That's the point. We're going to have all this space left over. Spaces like freeway. Because it's very interesting. We didn't know that the car was coming in Adelaide Street back in 1900, but we had an urban form that looked something like that and there's the carts and so on, so enough room to move around with a cart. We had a desire in the 50s to put in these streetcars, but they went. And now we've got pedestrian crossings like that over them, over it. Look at that poor pedestrian trying to get across through here. It, I, I don't understand Adelaide Street actually as well. I mean, it is very rarely, you know, it's pretty low traffic volume from my experience. But we've got all these spaces and then pedestrians can get over, over it quite easily. But perhaps we need the space for this. <coughs> and this is the half a million dollar thing that you can buy. So it's, you know, 12 metres long. You can start to see where I'm going with this. Now this is inside, so it's not just... Not just the house, but it's actually the mobile home that we take on holidays. This, this is incredible. I find this amazing. And then you get this. <laughs> you get the home towing a car. You get a car inside a home. And then you get a home towing a car, bike and a boat. And whatever else you can throw on. Talk about the kitchen sink. And then you have the smart car. Smart. We put the car before the horse or the horse before the car, whichever way you want to look at that one. <coughs> but I have to say that I love cars. And I love this movie, this, this, the Cars movie. There was one I nearly cried in as well because it was really reflecting a lot of you know, the country town I was up, brought up in. But there's, you know, Shoemaker meeting the, the local Italian tyre guy. That could be my father and my brother. He used to drive stock cars. 
uh, and I'll get to all this in a minute, but we personified the car to this extent, to put it into a cartoon that's actually all about freedom and, and the road trip. And, you know, the, a road trip is, is a fantastic thing to go on too. So we've got... And I'd like to ask, you know, when you got your first car, access to it, leased it, borrowed it, was there not a sense of freedom when you were younger? Was there not a sense of freedom? So it's something... Um, very strong, I think, in our psyche. This, this, but it's only a recent phenomenon, really. Which brings me to the micro movement in both the housing and the car industry, because this is what's happening. And Rod asked the question, why? Why we're, we're perhaps moving in the opposite direction from from the big, and some people are getting this. I mean, this is the space we most of us started out in. <laughs> I think. <laughs> And it's about this embrace, this gentle embrace. Um, these are our kids, by the way. But I don't know how many hours these kids spent just playing in a box like that. And I cannot, I can't remember how many times we built cubby houses for them in the, in the lounge room. And they'd end up sleeping in there for the weekend, you know, three-year-olds and going for it. So there's something in this. We, you know, I said on radio the other day that... Um, Adults are just really big kids. And these experiences that we've had here, we carry them through our lives. But we seem to have lost it. But we have a rich history of small spaces in the world, you know. The, the Arctic, the tea ceremony in Asia. Something that we might need as sea levels rise. Um, it's happening, it's happened. Um, Presbyterian camp that was tents so they had the small space for the tent the more often they went back the more they made it more permanent there it is in, in the US this is an interesting one in the Caribbean where workers could not own land but they could own their building so they built the buildings so tiny that they could move them around on rollers from workplace to workplace and that's how it became called the chattel house so this is stuff that's going back you know, hundreds of years. We've got a rich history of it. The Katrina moment spawned this little number. That's Hurricane Katrina. A whole group of designers got together and designed it. This is a, a throwaway house that can be put up in a, in a few hours. He seems happy. Once again, why is it when we're on holidays we seem to just relax and, and we can make use of these incredibly small spaces? There's a sense of community here. We're right next to each other. We might not be related to each other. Point being, these all have access, all these little spaces have access to bigger spaces. And that's a point that we, we really need to keep in mind when, when we're going into denser areas and densification and the micro stuff. You need to get out because there's only so much time, believe me, that you can spend in living in a very tiny space. But it means public spaces then become very important. We do it here in, in Brighton. I, I haven't been able to work out how much it costs to actually rent one of these on the beach. We're doing it here in Australia, Brighton Beach in Victoria. It's something that even the modernist master like Le Corbusier <laughs> said. 14 square metres was his little holiday shack in, in the Riviera. That's it there. That's him looking out of the window. <coughs> very, very famous people. Arguably Heidegger, Martin Heidegger, arguably one of the greatest philosophers of the 20th century contributed to so much to postmodernism and postmodernist thinking. Um, he spent a lot of time writing his theories out in a four-room hut in the Bavarian Alps. He was the one that put us onto the concept of dwelling and, and wanting to stay in one space and really enjoy living in one space. Bachelard talk, got, dedicated an entire chapter to the hut. So this is these are similar works. Christopher Alexander, anyone... Heard, seen, yep. Um, he said, at the, right at the introduction, he said, once you've worked out what you want to do, make it small as possible. And the secret to it is to overlap different uses at different times in the day. That's the secret to small spaces. And you may, by the layering of meaning and the layering of uses and the layering of activities, you might end up with buildings as poems. That's what he was claiming, right at the front of his work. Don't forget Shoemaker, Leo Young, Asia. We look to Asia for the miniature, the mastery of the miniature. An architect who wrote and developed so many little huts outside the circle of architecture. 
George, George Bernard Shaw. That was his writing hut. That's where his that was his creative space. It spun, so he could get the sun coming in. <laughs> Hewlett and Packard spawned Silicon Valley from a garage. That's Roald Dahl's writing hut. There he is, smoking away. That was it. On Walden Pond, the road, fourteen square meters again. Three chairs, one for self, one for friend, one for society. Jane Austen, that was her creative working space. I think about computers and, and um, commuting. Which brings us to this. This is a two, two and a half metre wide house in Boston. That's the bed, folds down, takes up the whole width of the house. It's got two chairs though. That's it there on the driveway. <laughs> and 4 BC the other day, I shouldn't have said that, but they were having a go at me about driveway housing. Well, this is the lengths that we go to. And I'm saying here in, in Spring Hill, for example, why couldn't we do that with these sort of things? These leftover spaces <coughs> that may be under the house, down the driveway, down the back. These are spaces that, if you downsize, can be filled in the street. We've got a rich history. These are, this is the form of housing that was being built post-colonial in Brisbane, in, in Queensland, obviously, in, in the 1890s. Smallest house, and they claimed it to be the smallest house in Australia, in, Victor in Victoria, two and a half metres wide. Many families lived in that. Seven, seven people lived in that house at one stage. Queensland, Chilligo. That was hap he was happy with that. When we didn't have cars, we rode in a road out. This is a mining camp. Look at these little spaces. It's beautiful. Smallest house probably in Brisbane at Union Street. And that's looking up Union Street and have a look down the bottom. <laughs> this is what I'm getting at. These are these leftover spaces. Once we get these cars out or populated with these, because this is happening in the, in the motor industry as well. So you imagine the, the, the big mobile home, less than 2.7 metres long. You can fit four of them in that. We're getting thinner, smoother, fitter as well. And we go this, to this length as a concept, a fold-up car that takes up this space. I find it incredible. Some of the ca car manufacturing in, uh, manufacturers are getting into it as well. They're promoting the benefits of, of the smaller car with reference to a small mobile home that can be dropped in by a helicopter, a crane. A TT can even sit under something as small as that. And you've got this, the micro-compact home car. We even design a home to look like a car. I, I, I just don't know what's going on. And the Duesenberg that I'm playing was actually inspired by a motor vehicle that had been developed back in the 1930s. So motor vehicles, home, this is the connection. So just moving then into, into my small, small space history. I asked my mother on Mother's Day. <laughs> Tricky question. <laughs> uh, but she worked out, yeah, you probably were conceived in a caravan, so I think it's in your blood. <laughs> um, and yeah, beginning and end of story. But the point I would, I'd just like to make is that you see the custom line of the main line there towing it, towing that van. Um, we actually own every car that you see in the next few images, we still own them. And I want to say something about sustainability there. I mean, make an investment in something. These cars are still lasting and we're still being able to be driven around. We don't drive them around much because they that you have quite a lot of fuel, um, but that's the point. This is my love affair with cars as well. This is where I've spent the first 12 months of my life in the veranda, in Clay's veranda, waiting for this to be built. It was called the hut. My grandparents called it the hut because it was built from recycled materials um, that was gained from miners' huts. So that's where I spent the next 16 years. It's being extended on and all sorts of things happening. This is how we used to go on holidays. My father was... Uh, a mechanic, this hence he got interested in the cars. Um, he was an ambulance bearer as well. He had a mad passion for gemstones, so we used to go for these great long road trips in these in this ambulance here. And the, and the thing that on the left there is the dog box. It used to have greyhounds in it, but um, that, that's the three of us, the three siblings there on the back. And we used to play in that. It could fit a double bed and two rows of seats. We used to play in the back there while driving along out to Lightning Ridge. We even got snowbound once. We didn't sleep in there that night. <laughs> but a reminder about insulation. And all, every car we still own, 
This is us heading towards uh, Tomahawk Creek, the sister there in the caravan. We got to learn how to live really comfortably without a lot. That's us in the Nullarbor Plain, still own that car. There it is there in Houston Terrace in Milton when I was a student. It couldn't fit on the allotment down by the side of the house. It was that big, this car. Uh, that's the only shot I got of that house because uh, uh, I want to say that the smallest room I ever lived in was two metres by two metres and it was something like this. It was the front veranda just enclosed that was a student. I spent three years in that thing. But I did have the services of the house, which was uh, important. So where I'm leading to is what if we got all these things into the one small space? all the support services that you need in your one small space. And we were doing, I've been we doing this for years. I learned about this when I was studying and came across this, the Undue Subdivision of Land Prevention Act. And I think this is one of the reasons, and we still have this going today. How am I going for time today? Okay. Um, back in the 1880s, new, new act, get rid of the slums. Every lot has to be 10 metres by 40, minimum. One, one parliamentarian said they have to be 800 square metres. And this is what we've got still today. And the reason why there aren't that many terrace houses in Brisbane. And I'll show you how it's hung over. This is the first house ever designed and built. 15 square metres inside, two metre wide veranda. A three by five. Now, I couldn't call it a house. I had to call it a shed. But let me tell you, it had hot and cold running water. It had a table that you could seat four people around. Two double beds, kitchen uh, sink, a little stove that you could cook on, shower underneath, dunny out the back. <laughs> Didn't need much room. That's to prove it. That's me. Um, thinner and fitter. <laughs> um, but this, was, I'm still living in this building. It's now my studio and it has had many incarnations over the years to uh, getting on the computer there. Love affair with facades as well as you can tell. And uh, that's it today. You know, room on the veranda for a, a squatter's chair and a, a big dog. And that's it now. That's the studio where I've done most of my creative work in the last uh, 28 years, actually. There's a little plan of it. Um, it's in a book that I'm uh, about to publish. You can see there how it works, very quickly. This is the third house I built. It was 45 square metres and next to the 15 square metre one because you needed 45 plus 15 to make 60, which everyone thought was a real house. That was the ridiculous lengths we had to go to. There we are on the front veranda. And that's the floor plan. Very quickly, you can see how they operate. The 45 square metres internally. House number four was bigger. It was built next to the other, the other, other two. But it had about a, six, a 60 square metre footprint. And if you pitch the roof, all of a sudden you've got space that you can use. So we've got three bedrooms, a guest room and a studio space upstairs. And that's how you can live within... Within a 60 square metre footprint. So, all up, we've got about 120 square metre footprint. That's where we live at the moment at Mullaney in this hermitage. You can't see it. This is the re reason why we don't have solar panels. It's in there. We worked it out, trust me. But I've taken these principles, and this is my second house in Karamundi that was done about 25 years ago. It was a 300 square metre house. And Rod, I want to go back to where you start. This was our first major suburban house on a 300 square metre lot, but we only built 70 square metres of house. That's all we could afford. These days it's a different paradigm, isn't it? Build as much as you can. But we started out, and this is it. No one could tell the area of this house. And you had, anyway, took it then to the industry. So these are 50 square metre footprint houses. There was the design. 40 dwellings to the hectare, by the way, this. There they are, the little ones on the, on the top, three and two storeys. You know, great if you're active and can get up and down stairs because that'll keep you fit. There's one in situ in suburbia. And this one here, the one on the left, is actually a 60 square metre house that I'd argue one of the smallest houses on the Sunshine Coast. There it is, on its 120 square metre lot. Tucked in amongst all the others. Because they nearly got sacked over this front page article. We were trying to squeeze the lots in in, in Murchishire. Little did they know that we are actually doing them in, in Kalanda City. Um, but if it wasn't for this house, and Gabe, this is where I first started working with Gabriel, this house is a, is a house, a 130 square metre house on 250 square metres. Well, the idea was 
If you've got a 250 square metre lot, if you could build that and develop that lot as if it was your entire dwelling space, you've got a 250 square metre house. That's the point. See-through showers, so we, the whole sense of space, even in a very small space, is great. So use the ceiling of the sky. And that's the courtyard, that's the dining room. We compressed it even further, down to 180 square metres. <coughs> and then, oops. No, there we go. <laughs> Thank you for that. Where do you store your toys? So we've, we were getting at these sort of issues <coughs> well and truly a long time ago. And it's interesting then how people utilise those spaces. Here they are in situ in 25 for the hectare the retirement project. And last year I went back to school and did some research on secondary dwellings on the Sunshine Coast. I was asking one guy who lived in one of these. So each lot there is 330 square metres and the secondary dwelling is in the back. These guys here didn't like living in this little house. But when I asked them, would you think there's anyone that could live in this? He immediately went to his own mother. He said, if I could get one of these on the ground in my backyard, my mother could look after, uh, could be looked after. So it's, everyone's got a story. So who are we doing this for? Intergenerational. We've got an ageing, multi-generational, multicultural population. Four generations. I've always enjoyed these guys, the Lone Rangers, the Lone Raiders. So honing down that demographic. Swinging couples, people who enjoy swing music. <laughs> um, who, what are we providing for these guys? The beer-drinking, bass-playing babies. Graham, you don't resemble that at all. Um, cultural creative urban dwellers. So these are the, the sort of psychographics that we were, we've been looking at. The neos. Fonzie. Well, we're building them out. It's getting older. We're getting a wrinkler rather than winkler. Um, but the Urban Land Development Authority is building these 70 square metre lots out at Fitzgibbon. So it's happening for Fonzie. So Fonzie over the garage. So these things over the garage, unit upstairs. It's happening here in Brisbane. This guy is very, very inspirational to me. He realised early on as a musician that you don't make much money out of music, um, but he's a recording artist. And he knew that he could not buy the house, but he knew he could afford the container with the studio in it. So he knew that if he had to move, he was booted out of his house, he could take his livelihood with him. And this is Spark One Studios on the Sunshine Coast, and he recorded the album that that song is on. And uh, that's it. Small space, but he can get it on a truck and move it to where he needs to go. In fact, he's moved in just down the road from me. It brings me to Hutwheels. It's not a new idea. The micro-compact home was actually moved around on, on wheels. It was inspired, Hutwheels was inspired really, though, by this guy who was running for mayor in San Francisco or somewhere, I think had this idea that if we could bring these little homes in to a, to a neighbourhood for the homeless, that that person could live there rent-free in return, however, for looking after the park or being the, a, a community representative of some form of it. That's it there. It's three metres by three metres. A bath? We put our mind to it, we can do this. Jay Schaefer did, built these in, uh, was building these in the States. All very cute. Katrina moment, the person who designed and built this one said, I'm never going to own another home again except that one. And that's what she invested in and that's how she's getting around the country. Small. You know, we, we did the retro concept, but this was another inspiration for Hot Wheels. The truck hut, that was in Maloney just recently. The old geezers, and this is where I'm going. I want to take the tour like Slim, seeing from the back veranda and research small space from this thing. He was doing it back in the 50s. And I guess I, I thought, well, I'm not an architect. I'll go and approach one of Australia's greatest architects and his, his wife, artist Elizabeth. And he hasn't changed much. Um, I reckon he's as Australian as a slouch hut. And how we got together was um, I went out and approached him. He lives at Tagulawa now. He's still very active. Um, doing a lot of custom design work as well as his manufacturing work. 
And I said to him, I'd really like this Hot Wheels concept to have a, a three, something you could fit three pizzas in, because I used to be a pizza cook. And you learn, learn how to use small spaces when you're a, sh a cook and a chef and those names. And I said, I really would like something like that, a caravan thing. And he said, it's under the table. And I, I didn't get what he was saying. He says, it's under the table. So we dragged this thing out, and there it was. He was putting it into his own home at Tagulala. And he's onto this. And that was quite serendipitous, and I thought, really cemented the relationship after many years. So I come up with a design. That was it. Gabriel said, well, that's bloody useless. Look at that veranda. That's, that's, you can't use that. You're sitting there, you're squatting on a you know, toilet. So he said, you've got to open it up. Give the, get the veranda back, the veranda. So you've got some, you know, even if you're close by with other people, get a view to the sky, to infin you know, infinity. So he's got this idea of, and this was the harmony model that we thought. So it's fully self-contained. It's got a push-out double bed, this model. It's two chairs, dining area. Um, washing machine under the, uh, the, the basin there in, in the bathroom. The toilet up in the top corner. A little kitchen. Storage. Fold-down veranda and the roof. That's it. But, like many industries in Australia, or most industries in Australia, we're highly regulated. So breaking into the caravan industry, because this is built on caravan technology, the idea is built on caravan technology, using caravan type materials, but meant to look like a little house. Not a caravan, it's a house. So we've got the, all these regulations that we've got to comply with. And the biggest difficulty we've had is actually finding a licensed manufacturer who's willing to take this on and build them. Because production lines, interruption, no good. People want to build a bigger one so they get more money uh, for, the, for, the, um, for the work. And it's not just as simple as getting an existing trailer and whacking a house on it because of all the different forces and that that go on, particularly when you've got wind shear of 110 kilometres or 150 kilometres an hour because this is going to be towed along the road. Um, it's not as easy as that. Anyway, we decided we would have this. <laughs> These, this is what it includes. There's a trailer. There's a single day and, double day and night bed. Chef's kitchen, complete with gas oven to fit three 12-inch pizzas. A small beer fridge. A washer dryer, a bathroom, a water tank, a gas tank, high quality fit out fixtures, fittings, furnishings, and finishes. <laughs> Veranda. A sound system, a solar system, that means hot water and so on. LCD or an LED. Guitar, had to have the guitar, at least one. And the book that I'm publishing recently, soon, sorry, is uh, Herman's Huts. And there's a music CD to go with it as well. So downsize, not too much stuff. We developed the concept a bit further. That's it in SketchUp. Flat roof to start with over the, over the uh, veranda. Gabriel didn't like that either, nor did Elizabeth. So we're in development stage still. But that's it there. And this is the universe, so the, the single person one. For the 30% of households in the future. That's the floor plan. And it's just simply overlapping uses in the same small space. The key to it, though, is the veranda. And it... Basically, the idea is that the floor, the roof will, will uh, fold up, the floor will flop down over the tow bar, and it will be then stayed in place. This isn't showing how you would actually get access up onto that veranda, but that's, that's it. Nine square metres in area, plus the four square metres for a veranda. What more would you want? That's a little shot of it inside. I mean, I, I could live in this, and that's my challenge. Could you? That's the hero shot. <laughs> Lizzie loves yellow. So if you're extremely lucky, you might be able to buy a new nine square metre house that will fit on a 20 square metre lot for $50,000. $50,000 because it's built on caravan te technology. If you were to build these smaller spaces in situ, I would argue you could probably cut a third of the cost of it. Put a few of them together and you've got a house. <coughs> an extended family. So we've got three models, the Harmony, for very close couples, the <laughs> or singles who want, a, who want some space, the double bed, the Universe, which is the single bed mo model for soloists who love to go it alone, and the Model T, we had to have a Model T based in the Tweed House uh, with a loft in it, so the more space downstairs. Um, I don't want to say more than that, any more than that. We're having our own Katrina moments. And Hot Wheels could have come in handy, I, I tell you, in recent times. Because we've got a theory, and this is 
getting to you, answering your question, Rob. Maslow, back in the 50s, had this thing called the hierarchy of needs. The basic needs are being met. We move from shelter, safety, belonging, love, self-respect, esteem, purpose, meaning to self-actualisation. I've got a different theory. I call it the fallback of needs because I believe that if we can achieve love, belonging and friendship, we've pretty much got it. And if we look back, fold back the other needs for self-actualisation and we go back into the most basic of needs, the shelter, and we go back into the smallest possible space, I believe that's where you're going to find yourself. That's a theory. Yet to be unproven ideology. Not only can you find out who you are, if you put that shelter to use, whack it on wheels, it may set you free. <laughs> so, embrace the smallest tranquil place. Dwell in the deepest memories of cubbies, cosy and posy, intimacy, immediacy, where everything's within reach for convenience sake. Find comfort in closeness, luxuriate in seclusion and reclusion. Ponder the paradox of privacy and proximity. Get high on life. Small areas, small areas, full volume, and imagine the close. Transport to the world of creativity, the future, fantasy, and romance. See an imaginary world that promises discovery of the secret, the unknown. Touch the subconscious, the sustained memory of the bliss and security of another's gentle embrace. Grace. The simplest things for simply living. Heightened awareness of daily functions and feelings. Feel crafted and timeless. Be close to the simple elements of one's nature. Pause in intimate places. An atmosphere created and adjusted for singular or coupling needs. Entrance until peace and fulfilment overcome. A place truly of one's own in a big country. Thank you.